God is amazing, isn't he? Yeah. And there's nothing that he can't do. No one he can't reach. No chasm too far or too wide for him to reach over and grab us and bring us to him. He is so, so good. In our lifetimes, we will never see the end of his goodness. I just, today I was just overwhelmed by how good he was. And what he's doing in my life and in the lives of those around me, I can just see him moving. And God's on the move. And he is drawing those to him. And we're going to see some times of revival coming in Canada that we've never seen before. And I'm so excited to see what God's going to do. This morning, um, one of the things we're going, to t we're going to talk about, forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of those things that can keep us from God. Unfor sorry, unforgiveness is <laughs> one of those things that can keep us from God. Matthew 6, 14 to 15 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now these are Jesus' words. You know, if you have a red letter Bible, you know every time it's in red, you know that's when Jesus is speaking. And... He came for us so that we can be saved. But it's very important to take the words that he says the way he says them. Because it's only through him that we can be saved. You know, last week Robin talked about um, salt and light. And part of the series that we're starting is just looking at how do we become more like Christ. And... How do we become the salt and light of the world? This week, um, with my kids, we homeschool, and I got to teach them science. And we did a, a st their curriculum is, um, is Christian, and it's based on Genesis, the seventh day of creation for the first bit. And so we looked at verse two and three of Genesis, where the, the world was void and then there was light. And we, we learned the science aspect of light, what light does. You know, the objects in a room we can see because of the light reflecting on them. Without light, we can't see. If this room was dark, we couldn't see each other because there's nothing to reflect onto us. And therefore, our eyes can capture it and therefore we can see it. And as we're going through this, you know, we are called to be the light of the world. But we aren't the light ourselves. We're just a reflection of the light. We're a reflection of Christ shining on us and reflecting off. And He is what they should see in our lives. Before I go into forgiveness, I'm going to go into something else a little bit. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. There's a reason that we need to forgive. Jesus said it. Here, if you love me, keep my commandments. Just a little farther on in 14, 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Here he expands. He who has my commandments, he who knows my word, and he who keeps him, keeps my word, loves me. 
And if you love me, you will also be, he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And he will love, the Father in heaven will love him, will love me, and manifest him, Jesus to him. Isn't that, isn't that cool? If we, if we follow his commandments, if we showing that we love him, he will show himself to us. This is a promise. This is a promise that he lays out. If you love me, you will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. We can be, God's going to show himself to us when we follow through and love him and love what he does. We can't, the way we show our love to God is through our obedience, through us giving up what he, following his commandments. Because it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. How do we show it? How do we show your love? How does he ask for us to show our love? By following what he lays out for us. John 14, 23 and 24 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Here he even says a warning. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And he didn't come to bring his own message, but he came to bring the Father's message. He's not even representing himself. He's representing his Father in heaven. This is the message that his Father in heaven gave to Jesus to give to us so that we can, so that he can manifest himself to us. John 15, 9-10 says, As the Father loved me, I also ha have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Mm -hmm. he, Jesus loves us the way His Father loves Him. It's this oneness, this closeness relationship that He has with His Father that He's now saying that, I love you the same way. Stay in my love. Don't, don't, run, don't get out of it. Don't, don't go away from me. Stay in my love. Stay following my commandments. Stay following what I've laid out for you to do. That is how you abide in me. Jesus kept his Father's commandments, and Jesus abided in his love. This is the same promise for us. We can abide in his love if we keep his love, if we keep his commandments. John 15, 11 to 14 says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now he says we can be his friends. doesn't just say we get to be his friends if we follow him, if we do what he commands us to do. If there are sin issues in our life, we need to take him to God and ask him to forgive us so that we can abide in him, that we can be his friend. Because it says, if you do what I command you, something else that he says to do. 1517, these things I command you, that you love one another. See, before I go into that one, in the Bible, in Bible times, the way they, they didn't have uh, exclamation marks like we do in English to, to really show emphasis on a certain topic or on a certain message. And so that what they would do is they would repeat it. And if we 
throughout, in, in, we see the different chapters. In biblical times, they didn't have chapters. It was just one continual book. So in that same time of scripture, in that same message, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many times. He's strongly, strongly emphasizing this point. It's not something that we should take lightly. We should be like, oh, we only said that once. It's not a big deal. He said this, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times, six times, just in that section of scripture in John. I'm sure if we looked in other, we'd find more. And I didn't do that. I didn't look that up. Robin probably would have, but I didn't. <laughs> so important. Jesus is stressing this point. If you love me, keep my commandments. All right, now I'll go to this one. These things I command you that you love one another. It's a commandment that Jesus gave. If you love me, we will obey that. As hard as it is, I find it's easier to love God than it can be to love his people. Anyone struggle with that one? <laughs> but that is what he requires of us. That is what he's asking. If you love me, this is, how, this is the proof. This is how you show it. By loving those around you. This is how we shine our light. To know what love is, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13. Oh, actually, I got one more. New commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love, if you have love for one another. This is how we show our light. This is how we show that we are God's disciples, is if we're walking the way Jesus has asked us to walk, and the way he showed us to walk. He didn't just tell us to do something from a pedestal, from the, from the king, high kingdom, and, oh, I never had to walk that walk. No, he, he came down to earth. He walked to the lowest of low, and show, sh he, he showed us by his own walk. You know, you've heard sto I've heard stories of, you know, kings that would um, high, disguise themselves and just walk among the people and just see how they are. I mean, I think it, someone did that in the Bible. I can't remember who. Um, but to see how the people were feeling, to see what the people did, how they experienced life. Because life in a, in a, ca in a castle in a, is a very different from life in the city, in, in, the, in the poor places of town. Life is very different. But Jesus came from the high place, and he came to the low place, and he walked at the low place so that we would know how to walk, and he could show us that this is possible. You can walk in my walk. All right, now I'll go into love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not selfish. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So how does that wrap up into forgiveness? How does that wrap up into what I'm talking about today? Well, we just saw that, first of all, if we love him, we need to keep his commandments. And then in John 15, 17, he says, These things I command you, that you love one another. So, if we love him, we will love one another. How do, what, what does that look like? How do we love one another? Well, this is how. We have the kind of love that Christ had. It's easier said than done. I'm, uh, I'm not all there yet. Probably never will be. I hope to be, through Christ. Maybe one day I will. But this is what he asks of us. If we love him, how we show our love to him is by following 
his commandments. And he clearly commands us to love one another. You know, if I'm supposed to, uh, you know, I'm, you might be wondering why you know, I'm talking about love when it's, I'm supposed to be talking about forgiveness, but you know, the Bible teaches that unselfish love is the basis for true forgiveness since it keeps no record of wrongs. If we don't keep a record of wrongs, we don't need to forgive because there's nothing recorded to forgive or to, to hold against anyone else because we're not keeping a record of wrongs. We can walk through our life loving each other. We won't actually even need to go into the forgiveness stage because, first of all, we never harbored unforgiveness. If we can love one another the way Jesus loved us, we don't need to ask for forgiveness for unforgiveness. Forgiving others means letting go of resentment and giving up any claim to be compensated for the hurt or loss we have suffered. It can be easier said than done. I'm sure every one of us has experienced unforgiveness or hurt at one point or another in their lives. And some have experienced more than others in their lifetime. The more you experience, the more you hold, the harder it becomes sometimes. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Matthew 18, 21 to 35. You can open up in your Bible, but um, we're going we're to watch it. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, the man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Is it hard to relate to that story? I know initially when when I read, would read that as a kid, it's like, that doesn't sound... Like, why would that guy just go do that? Why would he... He'd just been given, forgiven... Oh, I'll tell you how much he's forgiven. So, it was 10,000 talents. And 10,000 talents is 200 years of labor. 200,000 years of labor. It is 60 million working days. That's the amount that this man owed. 
Now, in modern money, that would equal $3.48 billion. So that man, the first man, was just forgiven $3.48 billion. Wow. What a jerk. <laughs> now, he, someone owed him 100 denarii. And that would currently be 5.41 US dollars. Can you see the extent, the, the separation difference in that? But that's who we are when we hold forgiveness against our brother or sister, or mother and father, or daughter and son. Whoever we hold unforgiveness against, that is the comparison. Because our sins that God has forgiven us of equal that, you know, $3.5 billion, the 200,000 years of labor and the 60 million working days. Can you, can you understand that, that grasp that? that? That's the difference. I don't know, when I, when I did the math on that, I was just blown away by how much he has forgiven us and how little we can often just belittle that and just be like, oh, it's not that big a deal, like, oh, it's fine, like, or do the thing where you, you kind of forgive but not really. You know, I've ever seen the kids, like, go, go to someone and say, you know, I'm sorry and I forgive you and... You know, they go through the whole thing and it's kind of going through the motions, but it's not really at the heart level. The type of forgiveness God's asking for is the heart level forgiveness. Because that's the kind of forgiveness He forgave us. Everything that He has done in our heart that no one else even sees, He's forgiven. The million thoughts that we have that are evil and bad, He's forgiven those already. When we ask Him into our life, Forgiveness of sins, those are the things he's forgiven, not just the things that we've done with our hands, but the things that, he says, if you've lusted with the eyes, you have sinned. You have fallen short. How many times have we walked in our life and we, we are sinning every, all the time, even before we knew Christ? That's how far Christ's forgiveness goes. Every single thing. But God is good. God is good. And you know, if, if you're seeking Him, and seeking... The most important thing in a Christian walk is not coming to church. The most important thing as a Christian is to be seeking God for yourself. Like Daniel, behind closed doors, where no one else can see, just you and God. That is the most important thing you can do as a Christian. Coming to church should come out of that. But that coming to church should not take priority over your time with God. Time with Jesus is more important than time with anything else. And it's in those times with Him that He tells us things and that He... He shows us how to become more like Him. He shows us these issues that we have in our heart. These things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. Things like unforgiveness. It's during those times being with Him that He'll show you, hey, you got this thing here. There is something in my life that I didn't know about. Or at least not on the surface level. If someone would have asked me if I had unforgiveness in my life, I would be like, no, I don't. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But God revealed something to me. That I did. And it was something that I had held against my parents, un even unknowingly held, knowingly and unknowingly, but buried and not really thought about. And so I asked, first of all, for God for forgiveness, but then I felt also to go talk to them and ask them for forgiveness because it's not right of me to hold unforgiveness against them. Plus, Jesus says, if you love me, 
you will not. So I had to ask for forgiveness, and it was, it was hard, but it was, man, it would feel good afterwards. It's like the, the air just kind of gets cleared, and God's able to forgive me again. Because as, as I'm holding unforgiveness, he can't forgive me. The very first verse we read, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. So if you're holding unforgiveness, if you're holding something that someone did against you, your heavenly Father can't forgive you. He can't forgive your $3.48 billion debt that you owe if you're still holding on to that five dollars you're still wanting that someone to pay you back that five dollars and you know holding unforgiveness it's it's for our good that we don't you know that there's so many diseases that are linked to holding unforgiveness in your heart and buried down they're actually the outer workings of that and this has even been proven medically speaking. You can talk to people. And, but there's a lot of things that are that we hold in our heart. What we hold in our heart will grow, whether it's buried or not. And those are the seeds that we'll see. Is, so forgiving others is not just for the benefit of us, it's, or for the benefit of um, God and just obeying Him, it's also to our benefit. Not that that should be the motive, but... In Matthew 8 to 15, I'm going to go before that first verse. It says, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. See, that, that's a continuation of the Lord's Prayer. He's explaining the Lord's Prayer to them. He's explaining that we're asking God to forgive our debts on the condition that we will forgive the debts owed to us. He's reiterating that again, so if you didn't catch it in the prayer, he says that again more clearly. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Sometimes we hold something against someone because, oh, we want to make them feel pain. We want to put them in, make them feel how we feel. We think that by holding on to, unfor to unforgiveness, we're hurting them. But in reality, the only one we're hurting is us and our relationship with God. We're putting a separation there that says, God, you can't forgive me because I'm holding unforgiveness because he hurt me, so I'm therefore holding a debt against him. The next verse after forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors is not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. What is a temptation? The temptation is that we hold on to our unforgiveness. Now these aren't just good morals to live by. Jesus clearly says, if you love me, 
you will obey my commands. You will obey what he says. Will you obey him when he says, forgive those who hurt you? Will you love your enemies? Will you love one another? Will you love your brother and sister in Christ? Will you hold hurt? Or will you choose to love instead? That's, that's the question he's asking this morning. What will you choose to do?